Good morning, everyone. There was a young man in the New Testament who was intimidated and uh, lacked the courage to speak up about his experience of God's grace in his life. Paul wrote a letter to him, and I think that there are incredible takeaways from the way Paul addresses this. And we're going to be in 1 Timothy, the first chapter, beginning in verse 3. And by the way, I'm reading this out of the message translation. And the reason I'm doing that is because for some of us, this passage of Scripture is very familiar. And it is so easy to connect to all the other things we've ever heard that we might miss something new. And so I'd like us to just, with fresh ears, hear this passage today. Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, every time I say your name in prayer, which is practically all the time, I thank God for you, the God I worship with my whole life and the tradition of my ancestors. I miss you a lot, especially when I remember that last tearful goodbye, and I look forward to a joy-packed reunion. That precious memory triggers another, your honest faith. And what a rich faith it is, handed down from your grandmother Lois to your mother Eunice, and now to you. And the special gift of ministry you received when I laid hands on you and prayed, keep that ablaze. God doesn't want us to be shy with his gifts, but bold and loving and sensible. So don't be embarrassed to speak up for our master or for me, his prisoner. Take your share of suffering for the message along with the rest of us. We can only keep on going, after all, by the power of God, who first saved us and then called us to this holy work. We had nothing to do with it. It was all his idea, a gift prepared for us in Jesus long before we knew anything about it. But we know it now, since the appearance of our Savior, nothing could be plainer. Death defeated, life vindicated, in a steady blaze of light, all through the work of Jesus. Um, everyone, everyone is a natural evangelist. <laughs> as soon as I said that, I know some of you are going, nope, not everyone. In fact, not anyone I know. It's not true. Every one of us are natural evan evangelists. When something good happens to us, when we have experienced something that we enjoy, we naturally want to share it with someone else. For example, if you have a great meal at a really nice restaurant, first time you tried it, it was just spectacular. You naturally tell other people about it. Say, oh, we went to this place. I didn't even know it existed. What a great meal we had there. And you don't ever think twice about it. If, you, if you've been to see a counselor and they helped you overcome anxiety or depression, you'll share that information with people who are struggling with anxiety and depression. If there's a line of clothing that you like and it goes on sale, you will tell other people about that, where they can get it, or what the code is when they log online. If you try a diet that actually works and you lose weight, You'll share that with somebody else. If there's music that you like, if there's a movie that you enjoyed, if there's a TV show that you're binge watching, you naturally tell other people about it. It's what we do. We're all natural evangelists. We like to share what we are enjoying or what has helped us. C.S. Lewis said this. If you don't know, he's a great Christian author. In fact, the Narnia Chronicles, they did some movies about that. Uh, what well, was written by him, but he, this is what he says. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses, listen to this, not merely expresses, but completes the enjoyment. Think about that. That we enjoyed something, but then sharing it with someone else, and then if they enjoy it too, it's like our joy feels like it was completed. We're natural evangelists, except when it comes to our faith. 
There will always be reasons not to share something about Jesus. In 2019, there's a, a research group, it's called Barna, and they do polls in America to find out what national trends are, both in secular society and in the church. And one of the things they discovered in 2019 is that nearly half, 47% of all people born between the age of, uh, from 1980 until the early 2000s, for them, when they were asked about sharing their faith, they said that it wasn't just uncomfortable. These are for believers. It wasn't just uncomfortable for them to share their faith with someone else. They thought it was wrong to share their faith with someone else with the attempt to change their view of something. 47% of people born between 1980 and the early 2000s said that they were not just uncomfortable, these are believers, not just uncomfortable sharing their faith, they thought it was wrong to do so because the goal was to change someone's mind. Yet, when you do a poll across four generations, and ask them what was the most important thing that ever happened in their life. When you come to believers, 97% of believers across four generations say the most important thing that ever happened in their life was coming to know Jesus. So for increasing numbers of people, the most important thing is off limits in a conversation. It's not just uncomfortable. They feel it's wrong. Now, it is true that today's Christians are viewed differently than Christians back in Bible days. Back in Bible days, religious leaders and political leaders did not like Christians. They were very suspicious of them. They persecuted them. They tried to do everything they could to hinder their progress. But the favor of the people, the masses, the, the citizens who lived in any region, they liked the church. It was the leadership that didn't. In today's society, that's almost flipped. It's like the, the leaders might try to, fit, to, to connect with uh, both political and religious, with other religious, uh, with Christianity, in hopes that something might be connected for a political purpose. But the general feeling of the population about the church is not all that high. And so how are we supposed to handle this? And like I said, there's always reasons, there's always reasons uh, not to share our faith. There are groups of people who feel threatened or frustrated when Christians do that. And so Barna provides even more research on this. They ask the question, what are the top reasons why you're uncomfortable with someone sharing their faith with you? So these are people who are not people of faith, and they're, they're going to tell us why they don't like someone talking to them about their faith. And the, the first reason is hypocrisy. You're probably not surprised by that. But what I want you to know is uh, we often think incompletely on what the word hypocrisy means. What most people say, it's saying one thing and doing another. Um, that doesn't necessarily have to be hypocrisy. For example, let's suppose uh, you want to lose a few pounds. Let's say COVID got you, not the disease just all the weight you gained while you couldn't do anything else. And so uh, I won't ask how many added a few COVID pounds, but uh, it, it can happen. And so, so you decide, all right, I'm going to start a diet. I'm going to start it on this day, and I'm going to, and then there's all kinds of diets out there, just all kinds of options. And you might even tell other people, I'm really going to try to lose some weight. And then, and then they see you standing in line at the ice cream shop that just opened. And that's not on that diet. And they don't come up to you and you say, you're such a hypocrite. They don't. And in fact, if, even if you're trying to correct more serious issues in your life and you fail, and you acknowledge that to people, you say, I was really trying to get over this, and I, f I fell back into it. Usually people will have empathy with you. The problem isn't what we say we're trying to do and then whether we succeed or not. The problem is when we tell other people what to do and then we don't do it. That's what really bugs them. 
And the church has a little bit of a history of telling society how it should live. And then the headlines come out about leaders and other people in churches who just don't quite measure up to it. So why are they telling me to do that when they're not doing that? And so hypocrisy, that can be a real issue. Um, there's another reason, politics. I know you might be surprised by this, but Christians can sometimes assume that their political party is the one chosen by God to fix the rest of society. And what you need to know is anybody who doesn't agree with that political party is now disinterested in your faith because you've married them together. And, and that doesn't help the cause. People should not feel like they have to join a political party or a political cause or support a political candidate in order to experience the grace of God. Politics works against the church and our capacity to share our faith. And then the third reason they found, and this actually has three subparts to it, a lack of humility, lack of approachability, lack of empathy. What does that mean? A lack of humility, sometimes Christians can come across as though we have all the answers. We do not have all the answers. We don't even know all the questions. We have some answers, and we know someone who has all the answers, but that's not the same thing. How many will acknowledge this morning, you do not have all the answers? If your hand's not up, I'm coming after you. I got some things that I'm going to ask you. Uh, so approachability, there are some people who keep their distance because they don't approve of a person's behavior. They, they, because they're frustrated by a way a person is talking or a way a person is acting, they just, they create distance. And here's what you know, grace works best close up. The further away you get, the less influence for the grace of God you can be. It's just true. Not caring about someone because of how they got into their situation closes the doors to the gospel for everyone who needs it the most. This idea of, of empathy, right? So uh, if you're in the medical field at all, uh, when a person comes into an emergency situation or an urgent care situation, they will often ask what happened. They might even ask how it happened, but they don't refuse to help you because you did something inappropriate. Um, it was a Father's Day, and I was out back of my house, and I was rolling up a hose on a reel, and I was doing it pretty quickly and something happened I didn't anticipate. The end of the hose got up to the base of the reel that I was uh, pulling it up on and it bounced off the bottom. It popped up in the air. It hit me in the face and created a great split that needed stitches. Just smashed my lip wide open. And so I went to the hospital and I got checked into the emergency room. And the nurse came in and she said, what happened? And I showed her, she said, how did you do that? I said, well, I was rolling up in the base and it hit me in. And she says, yeah, we're getting a lot of stupid injuries today. <laughs> I said, hey, that's pastor stupid to you, just so you know. The, the, the idea is, is that she did, this is what she did not say. She did not say, since you did a stupid thing, I'm not gonna help you. You deserve that. That's what should have happened. You should pay better attention. Go home and bleed. <laughs> she would not, no doctor would ever do that. It doesn't matter how it happened, it just matters that there's a need. And let me tell you this everything, everything Christian is about is helping people who are struggling with the presence and the power of sin in their lives. Of course, sin played a role in it. And if we keep creating distance from people because of their sin, we will have no voice in helping them find the grace of God for themselves. I think we should take our cues from Jesus. He didn't shame people. He didn't condemn people in life because that they failed. He didn't treat people as though that they were less because they struggled with something or because they didn't understand something. He didn't shame sinners. He welcomed them. Think about that. 
He cared about those who struggled in life, and he wound up actually being accused of being like them because he spent time with them. That's Jesus. So how did Jesus invite people? What kind of language did he use? He would say things like this. He'd say, I know life is exhausting. I will give you rest. I know the burdens of life are heavy and soul crushing. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I know that there is sickness and disease. I have come as a physician. He came to people who felt ashamed, and he brought encouragement. He was a lover of those who actually tried to undermine him. He could take an enemy and turn them into a friend, and he could take a friend and turn them into family, and he could take a family member and turn them into a participant into the mission that makes a difference for eternity. That's what Jesus did. So why can't the church look more like that? Why are we so timid to share the very best thing that's ever happened in our lives? And that's why I love this passage of Scripture, because Paul gives us incredible information. And the first thing is, if we are going to share with others our faith, if we're going to allow our natural evangelism to include our faith experience, we've got to learn to encourage each other. And the first is this, affirm your love and acceptance of other believers Just when you're here. I mean, look at what Paul said in this passage. Every time I say your name in prayer, which is practically all the time, I thank God for you. Think about that. What would it be like if, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we would tell each other, I thank God for you, and, and he goes on. I miss you a lot, especially when I remember that last cheerful goodbye. I miss you when you're not around. I miss you. And then thirdly, I look forward to a joy-packed reunion. What is he saying? I thank God for you. I miss you when you're not around. I look forward to every time we get together. How many think that could be encouraging to have people talk to us like that? Instead of walking in the room and watch people walk the other way or walking in the room and seeing the eye roll or some, you know, just, well, I guess, I guess you finally made it. Welcome back to the land of the living. That's, that's not encouraging. When you feel like you have good relations, this is why it's important. When you feel like you have good and solid relationships, you're more likely to enter into a conversation that feels risky outside of that circle. If I don't have any good friends in here, I'm not going to burn any bridges out there. And this is something that the church can do. Secondly, affirm another's faith is genuine. See, this is what the Apostle Paul could have said to Timothy. Timothy, what is wrong with you? Jesus died on a cross for you rose from the dead and you can't even speak up. I'm being beaten and put in prison and you can't even speak up. Where's your faith? What kind of faith is that? That's not what he says. Look at what he says. That precious memory triggers another. Your honest faith. And what a rich faith it is. Who's he talking to? The guy who's afraid to speak up. And what a rich faith it is. Handed down from your grandmother Lois to your mother Eunice, and now is in you. When we experience disappointment in life, or we're going through something that has been unresolved for a very long time, we can have a lot of self doubt. Like, what's wrong with me that I'm not managing this situation well? Or what's wrong with me that I don't seem to be able to pray and everything gets instantly resolved? And a lot of that doubt begins to seep in. And here's the mistake most of us make. Most of us think that that doubt is doubt in God. It's not. It's doubt in yourself. Your faith in God can still be intact even when you're doubting yourself. You are not God. And that should be a relief to all of us. If we don't feel confident, we wonder if our faith is authentic. 
Timothy could have doubted his own faith just by reason of his association with the Apostle Paul. I mean, here's a guy who's incredibly bold, not intimidated by anything, quick on his feet. You almost can't catch him off guard. And Timothy compares himself to that guy and says, yeah, my faith is weak at best. But this is what the Apostle Paul says, and I love this about him. This is what he says. I am an expert in faith. I'm the guy people call when they want to know if faith is authentic. And what I want you to know is your faith is authentic. It's real. It was real in your grandmother. It was real in your mother. And it's real in you. I know the real thing when I see it. How many would love someone to talk to you like that? Wouldn't that be great? I know your faith is authentic. And then affirm that they have something valuable to share. Look at what he says. A special gift of ministry you received when I laid hands on you. Some people think that what Paul is saying, I gave you this gift. And that's not what he's saying. He was just saying, I was present when I was praying for you. Remember that time my hands were on you? And God poured that rich, valuable, and incredible gift into you. Keep that thing ablaze. God doesn't want us to be shy with his gifts, but bold, loving, sensible. God gives valuable gifts. We shouldn't devalue what God has given to us. It comes from him. It's valuable just by reason of who it came from. So what does he say? Share your gift boldly. It just simply means you value the gift so you, you don't mind sharing it with someone else. The reason we fear sharing our gift is because often we, we're concerned if someone rejects our gift, they're rejecting us. Has anybody ever seen a game show on television or one of those YouTube channel things where they just give ridiculously valuable things away? Just me, okay. Well, it happens. Um, there's a guy on YouTube and he, he makes a lot of money on YouTube. And so one of the things he has done is he will go buy cars. And then he will log in as an Uber driver. And then he will give somebody a ride. And at the end of the ride, he'll give them the keys to the car and say, the car's yours. <laughs> My messages are not complicated. <laughs> See? So what's, what's the idea here? Suppose a person looked at them and said, <laughs> That's a very generous thing to offer, but I, I can't accept that gift. Would the person feel rejected because the gift wasn't accepted? And the answer is no. But that's what we're afraid will happen if we talk to someone about faith. So offer your gift boldly. Offer it lovingly. We're not trying to force something down someone's throat. You can actually love a person, care deeply about them. And when you talk to them, that love is, is betrayed in your tone, in your choice of words, in your language. Uh, there are people who speak in unloving, very harsh, caustic, and disrespectful ways. And they might even say, I'm just telling you this because I love you. Well, they're hiding their love behind their their caustic and harsh and disrespectful language. And the person who hears harsh and caustic and disrespectful language does not feel loved. They can tell. And, and Paul says, I want you to share your gift boldly. I want you to share it lovingly. And I want you to share your gift sensibly. Sensibly. So what does that mean? Well. Uh, sensible means basically three things. Uh, wise, prudent, and, and, uh, and benefit. If you're going to do a sensible thing, it should be something, an action of good judgment. If you're going to do a sensible thing, prudent just simply means that you care about how this is going to work out over the future, not just an immediate thing. A prudent thing is, is about caring about the future. And then benefit. How is it to their advantage? And this is what Paul is, is telling people. Paul is telling Timothy and us. He's saying, when you share your gift, share it in a way that you're sharing it with good judgment, 
that it makes a difference in someone's future and they can see the benefit from it. That's a really good way to wrap a gift. And, and there are really easy ways to do that. Most of the opportunities we have for sharing our faith actually comes when a person is experiencing a significant need. Something painful or unsettling has happened in their life. And sometimes those individuals, when we approach them, because of our desire to share our gift, it almost feels like we're ignoring their situation and changing the topic. Well, I know you're going through a painful trial, but let me tell you about Jesus. And, and that's not the best way to approach that. We need to approach it sensibly. Connect what they're going through to what Jesus can do to help them in the season that they're in. Lean into the flow of what's happening and what Jesus wants to do in that moment. For the example, if they're afraid, maybe you have words of comfort you could speak to them. If they are pain, in pain, maybe you could speak hope to them. If they are filled with self-doubt, maybe you could speak strength to them. So let me give you an example of this. Let's suppose that someone that you care a lot about, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's a coworker, a good friend of yours, and you come in and you see them and you discover that they seem very uh, unsettled, they seem very frustrated, they, they seem very hurt, their, their emotions are very obvious, and, and, and it looks like tears are about ready to, to run down their face, and, and, their, and their lips might even be trembling a little bit, and, and you go up to them and you say, what's going on? Are, are you okay? Is there, what's wrong? And, and they look at you and they say, I, I, don't, I don't know what to say. I just found out from my spouse that, that they're declaring this marriage to be over and, and they walked out and now I'm home with the kids and I don't know what I'm going to do. And if in that moment you go, well, let me, let me tell you about the Romans road. They're just going to look at you and go, I don't know about a road in Rome and I don't care about that right now. I'm really going through a very hard time. And so let's suppose that you responded to the need that they're in. I can't imagine how devastating and painful this must be for you. And I'm really sorry that you're going through this. In fact, I imagine you're going to have a lot of strong feelings about this. And so the first thing I want you to know is that you can talk to me. I've got two ears. And both of them work really well, and I'm happy to listen to what you have to say. And then maybe you could say something like this. I don't know if your spouse will change their mind or not. All I know is, is that no matter how this goes, it's going to take a lot of strength. And what I know of you, you're a strong person. Maybe you don't see it in yourself, but I see it in you. And then maybe you could say something like this. In my own life, when I've experienced some things that were very unsettling and very frustrating, I found something that helped. I found that when I prayed, I actually felt a little better and things got a little better. And I'm wondering if it would be okay if I could pray for you right now. And, and when you, and most people in that situation will say yes, how many have, have, have know the, the phrase KISS? K-I-S-S. -S. What does it stand for? Yeah, we're going to change that. Uh, so, I, so it's not just keep it simple, stupid. It's, it's, it's going to keep it short and simple. K-I-S-S, -S, short and simple. So if, if you were telling somebody about a restaurant that you liked, you might even tell them what you ordered. And, but you wouldn't tell them everything that was on the menu and all the directions you took to get there and the name of every person that you met in the restaurant. You would just go, they've got really good food there. So you pray a really short and simple prayer, not about calling attention to yourself, but about calling for help from God. And it could be something as simple as this. Trust me, this is a powerful prayer. Heavenly Father, my friend is really struggling right now. And we don't even know all that they need, but you do. Would you help them? In Jesus' name, amen. That's it. 
And then the next time you see them, follow up. Ask how they're doing. Offer to connect. If there's something you can actually do to help them, offer. It's amazing how often that actually helps share our faith. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. The last point is to trust God. Look at what he says. We can only keep on going after all by the power of God who first saved us and called us to this holy work. The opportunity to share our faith comes from God. The insight and the understanding that we share in that moment comes from God. The answers to a prayer that we would pray come from God. So, well, I just don't trust myself in a situation like that. Good. We shouldn't trust ourselves. We don't know what to say. We don't know what to do to close the gap between the grace of God and a lost heart. We could easily get that wrong, but I'm not just trying to repeat something that I heard someone say. I want to be present for the person who's struggling and connect them to a God who cares more than they could possibly know. And just tell them, I want to pray for you. And just so you know, I found prayer really helpful, but it's not because I'm so good. It's just because God is so generous, and I think he would love to be generous with you right now. And that could be the very first and most significant step of a person coming to faith in Christ. We're all natural evangelists. Let's include our faith. Let's bow our heads this morning. I'm not asking you to go down the street and find strangers. I'm not asking you to leave little printed documents underneath your plate at a restaurant. I'm not asking you to stand and, and yell with as much volume as you possibly can what you know about God. I'm just asking you to be willing to have a conversation with someone when they identify a point of need. Maybe God, maybe God divinely arranged for that appointment. And maybe he's hoping you're willing to have that conversation so he can release what that, person's, what that person needs and their life can be forever changed. So Father, Help us. While we're sharing about our, our movies and our music and our clothes and our restaurants, help us share you too. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.